This is the Aflac Insurance Syracuse Legend Show, talking to the biggest names in SU sports history, broadcasting in the ESPN studios, and presented by SummitCars.com. Here's your host, Mike Bristol. All right, here we are on it. My good friend, Mr. Damian Rhodes, kicking things off here on the Syracuse Legend Show. All right, man, what's been going on? What's happening? How you doing, man? It's been a while. I haven't, I haven't done this since we were co-hosting together for a bit. Long time. We did a lot of co-hosting on the Circus Legend Show. Go out and have a little dinner afterwards when you're living in the coast. Oh, yeah. Now you're Rochester guy. Oh, yeah. Yep. How's Rochester? I love it. It's. Uh, I mean, I was born here, so uh, before I moved to Syracuse and all my family kind of originated from this area. So in a way, it's you know always somewhat been home. Spent a lot of time out here as a kid. Weekends, etc. So well, you're in upstate. You know, it's it, nice it, kind of be back. It's still, upstate, upstate. Yeah, it's still upstate it's, New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're just and like, I still get to Syracuse for work, so I feel like I'm not there. How's the work thing going? Well, first of all, family. I mean, you you've been busy. The, the kiddos and marriage and all kinds of good stuff. Here. All these things, you know. Uh, <laughs> my son just turned three last week. Um, this past Tuesday, my daughter's one. Wow. Yeah, things change quick, don't they? <laughs> How's the golf game? You get any time to work on the golf game? Uh, the golf game's good. Yeah. You no, know, I'm over at Monroe out here in Rochester. Um, yeah, it's uh, handicaps doing well. What is your you handicap? Know, it's golf. What is your handicap right now? Um, I'm a three. Wow, Rhodes, you've been playing a lot of golf. <laughs> you can't be us. Something during COVID. You can't be us a BSer here. It's a three. I they're going to say maybe a seven or eight or maybe, co- you know, freaking three. You've been chipping every day. Once you get, once the kids go down for a nap, you are obviously got your headset on, you're doing your business deals, and you got a putter in your hand. <laughs> Pretty much how it goes. You're working on that 90 yards in. You've got, you probably got a hitting thing set up somewhere in your basement or something, so you're hitting into a net. I know how you roll. <laughs> well, right. The nice thing is uh, my club has two simulators, so spend a little bit of time there when the kids are asleep. <laughs> I love it. So you and I obviously have spent a lot of time together, and um, um, you were great for Syracuse for a long time, and all together, FM guy, great guy, um, a community guy, always helping out, always doing some great things, and terrific football player. As a faithful a viewer, uh, as anyone in Syracuse football on a weekly bat basis, uh, how would you exactly diagnose uh, for turning things around here in 2021? What needs to happen? Well, first, COVID needs to end. Um, I think when you know, especially with a younger program, that you really need that that time with these guys in the off season and not having it in the normal format. Uh, that plays a, that plays a role. I mean, look at what happened with Michigan and Penn State. Michigan and Penn State aren't as bad as their records were this year, but some teams handled COVID better than others, and that's just the way it is. And all of a sudden, people get you know out. And Syracuse was lucky where they really didn't have that hit the team, but. Again, the off season is so crucial, um, especially when you have a younger team. And we played so many freshmen out there that really had no true off season the way you would get ready uh, for a season. So I think that has to happen first. But second, they just got to continue to build depth. You know, when you when you lose your first guys and your next guys are just true freshmen, uh, that's hard because as a fre- true freshman, you know, speaking as playing as one you do hit a little bit of a wall because your body's not, I mean, yeah, you may play 12 games in high school, but you're not taking the physical toll and beating that you are in in, in a major football program. So I think that's the next one. They've got to continue to depth. They have to. You know, I'm a big Dino Babers fan. I I think personality, coaching, everything about him, I'm just a fan of his. Uh, Obviously, he kept some key players. I know there's going to be several, I think, additional coaches or coaching changes uh, when it comes to offense, defense, and special teams, and that sort of stuff, is is that important here moving forward? Uh, I mean, you have to make changes of their of their need. Like you know, one of the things that is important is continuity, right? Like you want to be able to continually have guys that know know the players and continue to build the right things. But if those things are being built upon the right way, then you have to make changes to make sure that they are. Um, so you, ideally you, you, you want continuity, but if something's not working, then you got to change it, right? Like you can't just continue to do the same thing if it's not working. And clearly there was some disconnect this year. Granted, it is a COVID year. Give them a pass. Um, but when you see the same kind of repeat mistakes year after year, then it's like something's not working. Where's the disconnect? We need to look at this. 
All right, let's talk about it. Growing up in the late '90s, watching Q's, who was your guy? Who was your any single player favorite guy? Who who was it that made you really want to go to Syracuse? I mean, man, there's so many. It's it's you know, it's. I remember like looking. I had a poster in my room above my bed that probably my dad put in my room just because of the football one. Um, and you know, I remember having like my Marcus Paul on it, the late Marcus Paul, uh, Rob Burnett was on it. You know, all these classic guys from the late eighties, and then obviously, you know, you had the Marvin Graves era, um, where you just had so many dynamic players, and then McNabb comes along, and you know, this has been so many great players at Syracuse, and you know, really one of the main reasons why I also went was Coach Pascaloni. Um, the relationship I had built with him and Coach Walk, David Walker, who's you know he's a Rochester guy, and um, I loved watching him growing up and seeing him play. So it's just, but really that relationship with Coach Pascaloni and uh, and Coach Walker is really where how what really made me kind of want to be there. You know, getting close to you and guys like Kyle Johnson and Graham Manley and and Q and all those guys back in in, in that era. Um, you know, Kyle would always tell me about Coach Pasqualoni, how intense he was, and how this guy, in every facet, in every second of the day, there was something with football, and a student of football, but also a man of intense and incredible integrity. Talk about Coach P. He was like another father. Um, yeah, from a football standpoint, he was locked in all the time, ready to go. But some of the best things sometimes were just, you know, walking past him and just talk to you. And, you know, everything at the end of the day related to the X's and O's on this board related to the X's and O's in life and how to be uh, responsible, disciplined, be a man of the word, committed. You say you're going to do something, follow through with it. All those things which you need to do on a football field as a football team to help one another. If you can't do that in that setting, how are you going to do it in the real world setting when you know, you may have a family that relies on you or a boss that relies on you to get some things on a deadline, but you can't be committed to show up on time and do your part. Um, you know, they really do translate. And, you know, Coach P, again, was like a father figure to many people. Um, and a lot of times he comes across as this just hard nose all the time, go, go, go. But in reality, I mean, I think he's, you know, it kind of reminds me of, you know, Nick Saban. You know, he's, he's a player's coach. At the end of the day, if something's not being done right, uh, on the field, he's not going to look to the player first. He's going to think that he's we're not getting coached the right way. And you know, a lot of times he'll take he'll take it on sometimes on the coaches first to make sure that we're getting the instruction we're supposed to. So he's really he was a to me he was a player's coach and he was always you know there to have your back. And then you know now if you continue to make the same mistake, at some point you have to be held accountable on your own. Um, but yeah, I mean I, I can't say enough good things about Coach P and. The day he left is just actually heartbreaking for me. And to talk to piggyback that, how big of a mistake was it to let a guy like that go to this program in the history of this program? I mean, I think it it, it still hasn't. It's it, the the foundation that was built. I mean, look, you're going to have some seasons where things just don't go perfect. That's just the nature of it. I mean, look look at Florida State right now. Look where they are. You know, look at Tennessee. Because of some of these other big programs. I mean, when I when I was playing and being recruited, Oregon wasn't the Oregon we know now. Alabama was they were six and five, five and six every year. They didn't have Nick Saban. That's everybody that's all everybody knows now. Some of these teams weren't that. And as a program, like you're gonna go through a, a down year or two. That's just part of part of the game. You know, you, you, you things just happen that way. Um and so when they make a move like that and I've talked to the old girls about it, and you know, it's it, it was unfortunate. It really was because you know. What we did he say? Just, what did Daryl say to you? Well, this is like past. This is like you know, a few years, years back when we were yeah. playing golf in Anabaga. Um But I, I think ultimately, too, I don't think it was totally, you know, fully his decision. But that's you know, not for me to really, really, yeah. truly speculate on how it all happened. I mean, you know, Mike, you know as well as anybody, being close to the, the, the programs up there that. There's a lot of, you know, sometimes politics that get involved that really don't come down to the execution. And we're on the heels of a, you know, sharing a Big East championship. And then all of a sudden, you know, we have almost our whole team coming back and we have a whole new staff. So we go from, you know, six and six to 
one and ten with the same exact team. That's kind of head scratching. <laughs> All those years, 2002, 2005, it wasn't, it wasn't always smooth time for the program. What kept you focused here on a, on a weekly basis? How did you How did you really dial in? I mean, football's a game where you can't, like, it's, it's physical, right? Like, you step on that field and the, and the ball's kicked, you're going to get hit in the mouth. And you can't really <laughs> have time to not be engaged because you'll literally get physically hurt and injured because the game is just that, it's just the way football is, and... Uh, at the end of the day, you still have, uh, have a, you know, it comes it goes back to integrity, right? Like, you're there getting a free education to go play football. And if it's really the sport you love and you really care about yourself and your teammates and you have pride in what you do, you're going to you're gonna strap in and lock in every single day that you're at it. Yeah. And you're not going to take a day off because that's just disrespectful for everybody that you're playing with, that you're playing uh, for, for the people that played before you, um, for the people that are paying for you to be there. It's just disrespectful not to be locked in and ready to go every day. Let's talk playing days real quick here. I know we got another minute or so. You, you scored 24 TDs, uh, and, I, and I say this because I know you have watched you play, and I know your athleticism, and I know the type of uh, uh, athlete you were and are. I mean, let's, let's face it. I mean, you have a few better players around you. Those TDs go up a bit. You know, I think the thing that the only I don't have any regrets about it. And I think we we have had some you know really great players around me. Um, I, I the thing that if I were to have one kind of thing that you know I guess would make me think about those kind of numbers is my sophomore year. I don't get a medical red shirt because I played one too many quarters yeah, and I miss right. the majority of the year. And I'm like, huh? Imagine if I played those other eight games. That's where right. would I be with all that stuff? Yep. Nope. So that's the only thing that I take away from that. It's like, okay, I was able to accomplish that pretty much in three years. Yeah. Yep. You know, that's, uh, I was very blessed. And, you know, it was, again, with great coaching of Coach P and then being around great teammates and players that helped me get that far. And, you know, the only question I ever have is what happens if I get that year back or I get to play those other eight games, where would I have been in some of those things? Did you miss the game or are you happy being away from the game? Because I will tell you the majority of my friends that have played college sports and or NFL professional get away and they do not miss it. They might, they miss the camaraderie and the friends and maybe the locker room, but they do not miss the the game itself, which I think is interesting. Especially in football. Yeah, because I mean, it, it just, I mean, even still to this day, I wake up and I'm sore sometimes. I mean, it's it's a physically demanding game, and if you play enough years, you, your body feels it. Um, but there's so much truth to that. Like, I miss, like, the locker room. I miss, like, certain things, like some of my, you know, there's certain songs that I hear that will come on that make me think about being on the bus on the way to a stadium and just kind of getting your pregame mindset in. Um, I miss, you know, even, like, when it comes to, like, trying to work out now, it's a lot harder to do when you used to work out for something, right? So yeah, it's like yeah. you try to. I just try to like work out so I can eat what the heck I want and not like feel like I'm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I work out for the heck, but not to have like a goal like to work out for. Like it's, it's, it's. I can't ever get back that level of trying to work out like I used to because it's just I'm not playing anymore. So why would I put myself through that? Um, so uh, the, the actual game at times I do, but at times it's nice, especially being a running back. I look back now thinking. Man, I should have chose a different position. A running back was maybe not the smartest position to be. <laughs> and my head still hurts at times. So, no, I mean, you, you missed the game, but at the same time, now, especially at 36, like, I thought of trying to play a football game right now. I'm good. I'm, I'm happy sitting down <laughs> watching it. I love it. Well, great to have you on. Congratulations with uh, your little daughter and your son. It's awesome. You got all these great uh, memories to make here moving forward. So, it's great to catch up with you. Play some golf this summer, buddy. Yeah, no, it'd be nice to actually hang out. I mean, you and I used to play some hoops and do some stuff together, but then I told you, you moved to Rochester. I got to make a, I got to bring my son up, and we got to make a day out of it. Do a little play, do a little whatever, get out and golf. Let's do it. And do all Let's that. Let's do it. All right, we'll Come set up. All in, man. We'll set it up. Bye, bye. Thanks, Dave. Talk Damian to Rhodes on the program. Incredible job and a good friend and just a, a great guy. When we get back, Trevor Cooney catching up with TC. This is the Aflac Insurance Syracuse Legend Show, talking to the biggest names in SU sports history, broadcasting in the ESPN studios, and presented by SummitCars.com. Here's your host, Mike Bristol. 
My guy, Trevor Cooney on the program. How's it going, Mike? TC, what's up? How are you? No, I'm, I'm good, man. How are you? Good to talk to you. It's good to lock you in. I know you've been busy. I've been trying to track you down here for a couple months, so it's great that uh, we got to si- get some time together. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm going to get right into it. Obviously, the Circus Legend Show, it's great to, to, to catch up and, and talk about uh, former stars and things that took place and all that kind of good stuff. So you came from Delaware to Cuse. Did did ha- did it have anything to do with Syracuse connection to a certain former law school alum and future president? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Nice. Um, and that that's what that's what started it. Uh, Joe gave me a call, said, "Hey, listen, you got to go to this school, and the rest is history." <laughs> no question about it. So, <laughs> given that you got Trish Waiters and others were on the roster, was there any question of you that that 2011-12 season? What were your feelings? What were your thoughts then? Um, I knew well. I knew coming into it that there was a, kind of like a backup spot at the guard position, um, and we had a lot of talented guards there. So I knew going into it, my minutes probably weren't going to be high. Um, so when coach kind of threw out the, the idea of, of red shirt that year, uh, I knew it was 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 a, was a good idea for me to do. So then, as a red shirt freshman. There was that OT win over Georgetown, the Big East semifinals, where you played a huge role. How important was that long term for your Syracuse career? Uh, it was. It was big time. I think that was the first time um, in my Syracuse career where I really had a, a huge impact into the game, offensively and defensively. Um, and it was a big confidence boost for me going forward that uh, that I could play at that level and 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 really. Uh, impact the game really were you you know you coming into syracuse did you have a chip on your shoulders were you ner- were you a little bit nervous like how were you when you really stepped into the dome and you felt that excitement you saw it all it's got to be unbelievably crazy uh absolutely there's there's nothing in in high school or AU or or anything that can prepare you for going to a program like syracuse and the games that you're going to be in and the fans you're going to play in front of. So, I mean, you just kind of have to experience when you do and, and get used to it because that's kind of how it's going to be. Um, and that's what you want it to be um, when you go to a program like Syracuse. Talking to Trevor Cooney, uh, as a sophomore, you were, I mean, face it, you're the team's really only true shooting threat, uh, quite, like, quite, uh, quite unlike today. But what was thrown at you? Uh, and teams were coming at you. Like, how was it for you realizing that, hey, you know, teams are going to come after me? Um, I would say I was always covered tight, especially in high school and AAU days. So, I mean, you, you get used to that. Um, but, I mean, I was fortunate enough to have some, some really good offensive weapons on that team to where guys could not just cover me or stick with me. You had to help on Tyler Ennis. You had to cover. You had to double team CJ Fair. You had to double rock in the post. So I was able to get a lot of looks that year um, just because of, of the other weapons that we really had on offense. You know, you look at some of the big games you had, and I think about Notre Dame a few different times. 33 points as a sophomore, big late points to win as a junior. Talk about uh, going after Mike Bray and taking down Notre Dame by yourself. Uh, growing, <laughs> growing up, I uh, and I still am, I'm a huge Notre Dame football fan. Um, it's something my, my family has always been. Um, when I was a kid, we drove out there a couple times to watch games. So I, I always got up for the Notre Dame games. And, and Mike Bray used to coach the University of Delaware, so he recruited me pretty hard in high school. Um, we developed a pretty cool relationship through that. Uh, but that was a game that, that definitely I, I circled on my calendar because um, just because I, I grew up a huge Notre Dame football fan. Huge football and Notre Dame fan myself. Um, when you, I, I guess let's talk about the competitive side. Let's talk about the, the athletic side of the game. And you look at some of these athletes today that are playing and, and guys that you went up against. I mean, who can you honestly tell me, if you can, I don't not necessarily want top three or top two. I really want like the top, the, like the guy. Who did you compete against that was the best guy you've ever played against and why? Overall? Overall. Just, or, just, or just at Syracuse? No, no. Overall, anybody. Who was it and, and why, <laughs> why, why, why were they that good? Uh, I was fortunate enough to to make the under-18 USA team yep. uh, my junior year in high school, um, and a guy on that team was Kyrie Irving. <laughs> so we he was he was the best. Um, 
so we had we had two or three weeks of training camp in Texas together, and then we had uh, the North American qualifiers together. And that was a guy who was so impressive from the start. His game was light years ahead of everyone else. He knew exactly what was going on in the floor. He could handle the ball like no other, never turn the ball over, and, and could score at will. Um, and and to, to see that at 17, 18 years old was, was unbelievable. You knew that he was just different from 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 there, really. I've really never seen a guy with that good of a handle that Kyrie has. I mean, I, I think I'm even like I'm going to look in the NBA now, I'm thinking of all the guys and the way that he handles the ball and the way that he distributes the ball. He's just incredible. But just his handle in general is I don't know. And if he had that at 18, you're telling me he had that same handle that you see now at yeah. 18? Yep. He could he could dribble through uh, presses by himself. He could he could do anything. It was it was unbelievable to see. Um, and he, he's by far the, the best person that I've ever played with or played against. Pretty impressive. Um, your senior year, let's talk about it. Obviously, lots of ups and downs that senior season. At low points... Was a Final Four run ever really seen as a possibility? Did you guys really see that? Uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're spot on. That, I mean, that year was was a roller coaster. Uh, right. We came in with really no expectations. Um, we had two fifth year seniors, uh, a bunch of young guys. wasn't really sure what to expect. We go down to Bahamas. We ended up beating UConn, who was ranked. We beat Texas A and M, who was ranked. <laughs> um, and then next, you know, we're in the top twenty-five. Right. Um, and then we, and then we have some tough games against Wisconsin. Uh, Beheim gets suspended, lose a couple in a row, um, and then you have no idea what to expect going forward. Um, got off to a rocky start in the ACC play. Uh, then we get Beheim back, and then we beat. Uh, we, we were able to to win a couple, win a tough one in Wake Forest, win in Duke. Uh, I mean, that year was, was all over the place. And um, then you get to Selection Sunday, you have no idea if you're in. Yeah. Then the bracket gets <laughs> leaked. And then you, you're trying to figure out if that's true or not. Um, it was it was a, a hell of a year. But um, looking back now, going through all those things throughout the year, winning close ones, losing tough ones, um, I mean, that team was just so so much battle-tested going into into March. Um, and I think we were so prepared for anything that was going to come our way during that run. Um, and I think that's why we were able to, to put it together, just because during that year, we, we, as a group, we went through so much good and bad that um, we were really well tested going into it. I, I think that really helped us. No, no question. Resiliency and just what you guys did was absolutely incredible. You know, I was just thinking about this too the Gonzaga game. You have that key steal, that clutch steal. <laughs> that was yours. And they they say what? Well, how do they not credit that? Come on, you got to still be fired up. Absolutely, uh, that is a play uh, and a rotation within that two three zone that um, that we work on every single day. If you're that opposite guard and you see someone go baseline, that's your rotation to that corner um, to, to to steal that pass. Yeah. And so I made that rotation perfectly, and I thought I was in. Clearly I was in, um, but the guy from half court called me out. And uh, <laughs> I was surprised they could not review that play. Right. But Tyler Lydon makes an unbelievable block. Uh, we get that. He gets fouled, makes the foul shot, and we still win, which is good. Um, it would uh, I would hate to talk about that play if it was if it was reversed. Right, it all worked out, which was good. You know, in, in years, you know, in, in an instance, even with the two Final Fours, I mean, think about that. Your time, two Final Four appearances, obviously you didn't get to the national title, but what an impressive run as a player as well as working with these other guys in that time frame to accomplish a couple of those. Yeah, to, I mean, it's one of the toughest things to do in college basketball is to make the Final Four. Right. Um, and, and going into the season as a team, you want to, Give yourself a, a chance, an opportunity to to practice all the way until the very end. So to to do that twice and to be with two groups, uh, two teams that were unbelievable that came together at the right time and and to make that special run is something that that I will always remember and, and always cherish. Just because it, it's something that it doesn't come around to programs um, easily. So for myself to, to do it twice is, is, is something that is, is really special to me. Great. Trevor Cooney on the program. Why did you choose Syracuse? When you break it down, what was it? 
growing up, uh, I always wanted to go to a program that was a basketball program and not, not a school that was known for anything else that, that had a great, rich history of it and had fans and, and a program that, that you could really, that you felt awesome playing for. And, and when I went up to Syracuse and you had the 30,000 fans, it, it was just a no-brainer at the time. I, I just completely fell in love with, with everything that that program stood for, everything that the coaching staff had. Um, and the guys that they brought in, um, they were guys that were similar to me, um, guys that would come in and work hard. Um, so I knew that it was a perfect fit for me. Um, and I love the color orange and I love snow. So it really worked out. <laughs> What's Trevor Cooney <laughs> up to now real quick? Uh, I am uh, back home in Delaware where I grew up in Wilmington. I work for a uh, real estate and development company. We, uh, we did a project with the 76ers. Um, so I work at the 76ers Fieldhouse. We are the home of the uh, Delaware Blue Coats. Uh, I run events and programming for the building. Nice. So it's keeping me busy. I'm still involved in basketball, which is awesome, um, and still in my hometown. So so what are you doing with hoops? You, uh, some pickup? You, what, are you still running a little bit? What are you doing? Yeah, I, uh, I play pickup with some friends. Um, been in some men's leagues. Um, so I still I still enjoy the game. I still play whenever I can. Still got some um, hops? And then I look still, to, still got those hops? Yeah, yeah, I'll throw down a couple dunks in some oh, men's league. Oh, that and, a uh, boy! And, and, yeah, turn some heads. So. Yeah, I but love still it. I got it a little bit. How about lady? Any ladies? Anything like that? Yeah, I do. I do have a girlfriend currently. Oh. Um, so I've been with her for a while, which is which is good. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about marriage plans because if she listening, <laughs> I don't want to do that to you. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Obviously, great to catch up with you. You and I need to catch up some more, and uh, it's great to uh, stay in touch. Absolutely, Mike. It was great talking to you. Um, wish the best and, and stay healthy. Go Cues. Thanks, Trevor. Talk to you soon. Absolutely. All Absolutely. right. Thanks. Great. Trevor Cooney on the program. We'll be right back. John Desco on deck. This is the Aflac Insurance Syracuse Legend Show, talking to the biggest names in SU sports history, broadcasting in the ESPN studios, and presented by SummitCars.com. Here's your host, Mike Bristol. Does it get any better than Coach John Desco on the program? Coach, what's happening? Oh, not too much. We were getting ready to start practice, so I'm getting excited about it. Well, I tell you, just about everyone has SU pegged for the top of the national rankings, but I'm guessing to you it's it's got to be a victory just to get on the field. Oh, yeah, you know, it's, uh, what was it, like March 7th or something like that last year. Uh, so we did have a little fall ball, but uh, now it's uh, for all the marbles this time of year. So you look at the recruiting class, you look at the talented team here, you look at all the hard work you've you've been preparing for. you you, you got to be excited about this program and this team. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the future is bright. Uh, a lot of things going on, though, especially with the Ivies not sure what they're doing. Uh, you know, in men's lacrosse, there's been a lot of transfers. A lot of players have been going into the portal and uh, – some of the, you know, like Duke picked up a transfer from Princeton, who was maybe the top mm. player in the country. So all of a sudden that changes who they are. Hmm. That's interesting. And it's hard to probably, I guess you got to constantly be paying attention to that. But at the same time, hey, you're focusing on your team, your success, and what you guys need to do. Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, we, uh, you know, we've had uh, a number of players, uh, you know, come up positive, and, uh, and 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 that's either a good or bad thing. I guess it's it's never really good, but. Uh, you know the fact that they uh, have been through it already. That should that should hold us through the season from missing too many games. That's your worst fear right now. Uh, you know, like we've seen with Jim Beheim's team. All of a sudden, you have a couple of positives, and they have to quarantine for ten days or two weeks, and that can really throw you off. You know, it can throw off your practice schedule and uh, just off your rhythm or your conditioning. So we're just trying to stay healthy as best we can. All right, I, I always like doing this with you, and and obviously being a Syracuse legend yourself, but <clears throat> I don't think I've ever asked you this question. We go back to your playing days at Syracuse. Was there any doubt at any time? you'd end up with the orange or was there anyone else in the mix or somebody else or another program or team you might have gone and played for college you might have gone and played for um geez that's a that's a good question i think as soon as coach simmons called me and uh you know just just walking through campus um you know i've been up to at the time archibald for uh yeah. you know football games uh and coin coin field for stadium for uh you know lacrosse games uh, but I've never really gotten, uh, you know, on campus. And once I walked through campus and uh, he showed me around, I met with some people in admissions office. 
Uh, I was sold, so it was, uh, I, I guess I, I would have looked at some other schools, um, but uh, once I walked through campus, it was a done deal. Playing for Roy Simmons Jr., while so many lessons, I, I guess, luckily stuck with you, which one did the most and affected your own coaching style? Um, that's a good question, because I came from, uh, you know, West Tennessee High School. Right. And I had Mike Masser, who's a, you know, a Hall of Fame coach. I had him um, as a uh, um, as in junior high in my freshman year. He was the freshman coach and modified coach. And then I went to a guy by the name of Bill Warmoth, who was actually a Syracuse grad. And he was an All-American who played at Syracuse. So I was probably influenced a little bit uh, by him, not so much to have me go to Syracuse, but as an alumni of Syracuse. So very, uh, very disciplined uh, coaches, a lot of, a lot of conditioning, uh, a lot of fundamentals. So it made, made it easier for me to go on and, and play in college. And uh, then when I got to uh, college, obviously Coach Simmons Jr. And got to know uh, Coach Simmons Sr., which was, uh, you know, that was a real treat, uh, you know, who, who coached uh, football, yeah. uh, boxing, and lacrosse. And, uh, you know, he was, he was quite a man. He was an imposing man. And it was, uh, you know, learned a little bit from him, too. And obviously, uh, you know, Roy Simmons playing for him. And then uh, right away after my senior year, started coaching with, with Roy Jr. So he's had a lot of influence on, uh, on how I've coached, along with my, uh, you know, my freshman coach and my uh, high school coach, um, you know, on the varsity team. So. Uh, I've, I've picked a little bit from all of them, and, and certainly being with Coach Simmons for 19 years as an assistant coach and four years as a player, I obviously had some influence. No question. You know, I was thinking about this, too. Had there been the current rules for lacrosse in your playing days, how many goals a game could you have put in the net there? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> we always played pretty fast. Right, yeah. And we always had good face-off guys. Um Geez, we had one of the best ever in, in Tom Donahue, uh, who was a, you know, I obviously played and coached with Kevin Donahue for a number of years. And Tommy was like a, he was like an 80% face-off guy. So it gave us a lot of possessions. I always equate to the face-off kind of like a, a jump ball in basketball. If there was a jump ball after every basket, which there was at one time, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, the, the tallest guy or the guy who could jump the highest, that team was probably going to get the ball. <laughs> so to have uh, to have a guy like that have eighty percent or more uh, possessions in the course of the game, you're you're going to get a lot more opportunities in their team, and the, and uh, we would we would have scored more goals. You know, you mentioned uh, you know you're obviously being an assistant coach for so many years. When did you have those hopes or that feeling like, listen, I could be a head coach of the Syracuse team? Oh, geez, you know, I hadn't thought too much about that piece of it, um, coach. Simmons actually junior uh, retired a little earlier than I thought. So that, you know, gave me the opportunity, but you know, we were having, uh, you know, I, I came to Syracuse and played for four years. And at the time, uh, you know, coach Simmons junior started to recruit locally a little bit more. And, and we had some, we were kind of unknown. I mean, West Tennessee in particular, uh, you know, had a lot of great teams, but there weren't any state championships at the time. So it was, uh, you know, a little bit of a secret. And then, oh, after after I finished playing, four years after I started coaching with Coach Simmons, we won our first national championship, and it was a lot of local flavor on the team. And I had the task of, in my brilliance here, I had the task of putting the roster together. And instead of mm-hmm. on the roster, I wanted to show that we were like a Syracuse, you know, born and Ray's team. So instead of putting Camillus next to somebody's name or James Will DeWitt next to somebody's name, I put Syracuse because we're often, and I think a lot of coaches, when we, when we won the national championship, the, the smart guy that I was, um, <laughs> I put Syracuse next to everybody. And then they looked at the roster and say, where the hell put Syracuse? They just won their first <laughs> modern day championship. Where are they getting all these guys from? And here in, in my brilliance again, I had Syracuse next to everybody. So all of a sudden these kind of, Coaches started coming to Syracuse right. area. <laughs> right, and right. We're steal your players. <laughs> damned, if, damned if I do and damned if I don't, right? <laughs> um, 
you know, I've been fortunate enough to be able to get to know you, Coach Babers and Coach Bayheim, and three of the classiest guys, great guys, and all just really awesome people. And I see that you guys then, that goes down to your program, to the kids, and you can just see, obviously, the, the, the rich history, the rich tradition. You and Coach have so much history and tradition here at Syracuse and so much that you guys have given back, and I think Coach Babers will have that same effect here a little bit more time. Um, but I just look at um, how competitive all the teams have been. So whether you were a coach, a player, a, a head coach, assistant coach, a player, do you have a favorite era or a favorite team or a favorite moment that will always be like your favorite in lacrosse? Well, you know, I've had so many, uh, um, you know, between the, you know, I've been part of 11 national yeah. championships here at Syracuse. And uh, it's probably a good problem. I think they're 24 or something like that. Final four is out. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't looked it up recently. Um, but, you, you know, I go back to 1983, uh, you know, four years after I started with Coach. And, um, you know, we were, we were kind of unknown. Um, I think I was, uh, my senior year was the first time that Syracuse had made the, the playoffs in a number of years. So that was a feat in itself. And um, um, then when we go to 1983 and we're down to Hopkins, uh, I think it was 12 to seven at the time. It was in the, you know, right around the start of the fourth quarter. And literally people were leaving the stands. Uh, you know, Hopkins had such great tradition and they were expected to win the national championship. Um, and then all of a sudden we started coming back in that game and uh, end up winning the game 17 to 16. And you could see the fans, they could hear the roar of the crowd start coming back into the stadium because we were coming back. Um, you know, Coach Simmons Jr. always talked about, uh, he, he thought we were in trouble because you could hear the grills and you could see the smoke from the grills. <laughs> the tailgates outside the stadium. Um, so that one, I think, got it started, if, mm-hmm. if you will. I mean, not that it wasn't there once upon a time, but I think to come back and, and the way we came back and to win a national championship against a great Hopkins team kind of started um, the tradition of, of winning big games, and uh, uh, that was huge. And, uh, and I think in '09 when we came back, and we were – we were done and gone for with the uh, against Cornell and, and to come back and win the game in yeah. overtime. Yep. That was another another great memory too. Um, so, but I think '83 has to be a, a, a you know a pretty big one because it kind of started us all off again. I love it. It's incredible, Coach John Desco. Thanks, Coach. Like usual, always great insight, and it's always a pleasure to talk with you. You also, Big Mike. Uh, you have a great show, and uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. All right, thanks, Coach. Talk to you soon. Okay, bye, Mike. The great coach, John Desco. We'll be right back. ESPN Radio 97.7, 100.1. This is the Aflac Insurance Syracuse Legend Show, talking to the biggest names in SU sports history, broadcasting in the ESPN studios, and presented by SummitCars.com. Here's your host, Mike Bristol. All right, we got a good friend, Mr. Ryan Blackwell, on the program. What's up, Big Rye? What's up, buddy? How you doing? I am doing well, and I got to imagine two days away from the start of Liverpool practice. We hope. What are your emotions? What's going on with the team? How you feeling? What's going to take place? What do you know? I feel good. I mean, I hope. Hopefully, we don't have any hiccups because we only have like five weeks to play. And uh, you know, if we just shut down for COVID reasons, it's like a ten-day shutdown. So, not a lot of time. So, we're going to try to do what we can. Um, to get this thing off the ground and see how it goes. And We're excited, though. Does it go through, does Ari go through, obviously, the superintendent board and then it comes down with some sort of blessing, or has that already taken place and you guys are good to go? Yeah, we're we're good to go. They've been scrambling to get things off the ground uh, from the superintendent, gave us the go-ahead, obviously the county, Ryan McMahon, and then the, the problem is uh, teams like West Jenny or someone like that, their administration saying that so the state says you have to follow certain rules, right. the mass rules, as tolerated. So if a kid has asthma and needs to take it down, or and the refs aren't going to say anything, if the kids have the mask down and no one else cares, and it's fine. But a team like West Jenny saying that we're not going to play a team unless they have their mask up 100. percent So, so now we're trying to figure out the teams that we can play, and they're one, they're in our league. So normally we would play them twice. So 
they're going to be off our schedule, I think, and then other teams might follow suit. So it's just kind of we're trying to figure it out. Yep, yep. It's always going to be some sort of, some sort of hiccup, but it's nice that hopefully kids get to participate and coaches and everybody look at the the twelve months of of you know just sitting around and boy, it's time to get get going here. Um, yeah, we're lucky. Go ahead. I was going to say we're lucky because we've been doing workouts. Our administration is one of the only ones in the whole area that's allowed workouts for the last couple of months. So we haven't really been playing, but our kids have been doing skills and drills and been in our weight room and conditioning and stuff. So they're a little bit ahead of the game, which is good. No, that's good. All right. Well, well, let's get right to the fun stuff. Going back to your playing days. Let's talk about these playing mm-hmm. days of Ryan Blackwell. So you took the route Alan Griffin did, right? For Illinois to Cuse. What, what drew, mm-hmm. what drew you to Syracuse? What was it? What was the thing that, that pulled you to go play for coach Bayheim? You know, obviously it was a tough decision to even go to Illinois over Syracuse, but I had the connection, you know, I was growing up in Champaign and yep. the ball boy for Lou Henson. So it was really, that was the easy part for me. But then when Lou Henson decided to basically they forced him to retire and leave, uh, oh, it was kind of an easy, easy decision to come back home because he's right in the backyard next to Rochester, obviously Jim Beheim, you know, we know his career and his Hall of Fame pedigree. So, I wanted to come back and play uh, for him anyway, so it was a great decision for me. You come in as a transfer, ninety seven, ninety eight. After sitting out a year, was it better that you sat, or would have been benefited you or the players from to play right away? Like, how would you? How do you view that? You know what? Going thinking back on that time that that I sat out, um, I got better. Like, you know, I got ahead in school, and then in the weight room, you know, four times a week. Uh, with Corey Parker back then, and just being in CP. practice and getting acclimated to the system, yeah, yeah. CP yeah. crazy. Yeah. We're his guinea pigs, man. Yeah. We laughed because he used to have to do it like five hundred squ- uh, pound squats and all that. Right. And he laughs now to this day, but it was great. I, I got ahead and I got better. I think. Did all have to do? Let's talk about. Did all have to do with seeing as you get to the national championship game while you were a freshman at Illinois? I mean, you 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 got to watch that. Yeah, and I remember John Wallace talking to him, you know, after that and seeing him during that summer when I transferred. He was like, man, you could have been here. Maybe yeah. if you were here, we might have had a better shot. And uh, But it, it all worked out. Well, in the sophomore year, we all remember the shot you hit to beat St. John's in the Big East Tourney. Take us through that sequence and how that was set up and was it set up for you? Well, thanks. thanks thankfully, Todd Bergen tripped and uh, <laughs> almost traveled, and I was – you know, he had the ball in his hand. He was our best scorer at the time, and you know, that's what Coach does. He puts the, the ball in the hands of his yeah. – yeah, the best scores. And he got tripped up somehow, and uh, he saw me in the corner, and uh, Ron Artes was there guarding me and gave him a little hesitation pump fake and got open and just hit it. Think about that, who was guarding you. What an incredible mm-hmm. defender, incredible basketball player. You do it a little shimmy, and you get it up, and it goes in. Yeah, and he was because he, he had hit the shot to play before sure, to yeah. tie it up, and um, he was you know not happy, but he was always a great competitor. So the Big East back then, such great games, night in and night out with great players on every team. So great memories for sure. Junior year, so let's talk about your junior year. Didn't go as far, but what game from the ninety eight ninety nine still sticks out in your memory? You know what? It's crazy because every time I play Villanova. I had great games. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember going, I think, to Villanova, and I ended up, if I remember, like 28 points and like 18 rebounds or something crazy like that, just all all around solid game, and we won. And for some reason, I always had great games against them, and I remember that, you well, know, well, specifically. Well, well 2000 and, and Michigan State game, or you know, you had to take and winning the Big East, or, or talk about some of that. So we had a. I still think about it. We talk about it when I talk to Jason Hart, Eton, those guys. We, you know, arguably the best team in the country for a long period. We ended up being ranked like third in the country at some point. And um, towards the end of the year, we had a couple losses. But that game was a home game for Michigan State, and we were up nineteen or eighteen, whatever it was. Had a great chance, and then literally, it was like the air was taken out in the building. We we didn't score for like ten minutes. And uh, they locked up. They ended up winning it that year, so they were a great team, um, a lot of great players. So um, that was, you know, another great memory. So the great Ryan Blackwell, uh, also uh, head coach of Bayheim's Army, last couple of seasons, or years here. Uh, talk about the skill level. Talk about the guys coaching the team. Tell me a little bit about it. 
love doing it. Um, you know, I think that it's always fun to get back with those guys. You know, from I'm 44 years old, and I'm coaching guys like John Gillen, who you know are, are a lot younger than me. But the, the respect level is there, and I think the fact that we all played for the same coach at the same university is, is always special. And um, I think going forward. You know, Belby, I think, wants to go outside the box and get some other guys because it's fun to have all the guys from Syracuse, but, you know, we want to win. And uh, you look at all the other teams, overseas elite, done it with just team players from, you know, all different schools across the board. And I think that's been the case besides, like, Marquette and Ohio State. But, you know, we've got to bring some guys from outside the Syracuse family, uh, I think, to get it done going forward. No question. All right, the great Ryan Black. We'll love having you on, pal. It's good to uh, catch up. Hope the season gets rolling for you. An outstanding job here with uh, Bayheim's Army with your program and all that you do. It's always great. Thanks, buddy. All right, thanks, Ryan. Great to have you on, pal. Goodbye. All right, we're right back. Ryan Blackwell.